Welcome to the next lecture in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This lecture is going to continue on with our discussion of transactions. It'll dive into some advanced transaction topics and dive deeper into Bitcoin script. Uh, in particular, uh, you can see we have a number of different topics we're going to dive into. We will take a look at multi-signature scripts. Then we'll dive into a very common transaction script, the pay to script hash. Uh, then we'll look at uh, recording data in the output using returns. We'll look at time locks, scripts with uh, flow of control, and we'll take a look at some complex script examples and dive into segregated witness. So let's begin with multi-signature scripts. Multi-signature scripts set a condition where N public keys are recorded in the script, and at least M of those public keys must provide signatures to unlock the funds. This is also sometimes referred to as an M of N scheme, where N is the total number of keys and M is the minimum threshold of signatures required to validate the transaction. For example, a two of three multi-signature is one where three public keys are listed as potential signers, and at least two of those keys must be used to create uh, digital signatures for a valid transaction to spend the cryptocurrency funds. Uh, standard multi-signature scripts are limited to at most uh, three listed public keys, meaning you can do anything from one of one to a three of three multi-signature or a combination within that range. Uh, this limitation of three listed keys might be lifted at some point, so uh, you should check the is standard function to see what's currently accepted by the network. Uh, note that the limit of three keys applies only to standard multi-signature scripts, not to multi-signature scripts that you would create uh, wrapped in a pay to script hash script. Uh, pay to script hash multi-signature scripts are currently limited to 15 keys, allowing for up to 15 of 15 multi-signature. That limitation is also imposed by the in standard function, and that could also be changed at some point in the future. The general form of a locking script is uh, setting an M of N multi-signature condition is shown here on the slide. This M followed by um, one or more public keys, one through N, um, and then the number N followed by check multisig. Um, where N is the total number of listed public keys and M is the minimum threshold of required digital signatures to spend the output. A locking script setting a two of three multi-signature condition therefore would look like this. Uh, we'd have our two, we would have the specific three uh, multi-signature public keys, public key A, public key B, public key C. Um, then you would follow with the number three, so it's two of three. And then you'd have the 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 word the uh, the operator uh, check multi-sig. Um, that locking script can be satisfied with a locking script containing any combination of our minimum threshold signatures from the private keys, i.e. in this case, two digital signatures from the private keys corresponding to some combination of the three public keys. So here, for example, we've got signature B and signature C, uh, and so that would satisfy and allow you to lock the funds that were locked by that locking script. Uh, the two scripts together form this combined validation script, signature B, signature C, and then followed with the, uh, we start with your unlocking script, signature B, signature C, followed by the locking script, in this case, two, public key A, public key B, C, three, check multi-sig. And this combined script evaluates to true if and only if the unlocking script matches the conditions set by the locking script. Now, check multi-sig actually has a slight bug in it. Um, and due to this bug, uh, check multi-sig is going to pop one extra value. Um, so let's take a look. Um, and so usually to deal with this bug, we add an extra value. Um, and so typically, so if you've got a two of three uh, multi-signature, we'd put a zero up here at the front and then follow it with these two keys. 
Um, and part of this is problem is dealing with the fact that um, your locking scripts uh, have a max uh, keys of N, you know, N and they got this threshold of M and the script uh, engine has some difficulty dealing with the fact that there can be extra keys. Um, and so usually the way we deal with this is we just, uh, if we're doing with a two or three, we just put one extra value at the beginning that's a zero. And so our, unlock, our true unlocking script for this M of N scenario is zero followed by signature B followed by signature C. Um, and the reason why this happens has to do with the stack execution. Um, Cause if we go back to this previous line here and we take a look at what our, our, what is being processed. The very first thing that is popped on this is, uh, you know, ch check multi-sig is gonna pop the top item on, this, on the stack, which is this uh, three here, which is N. Um, and then it'll pop, um, which are the total number of public keys that can sign. Um, then it'll pop one item, which is M, um, you know, over here for two um, and the various signatures. But usually it'll pop M plus one and this extra one is disregarded. And so that's why we have this extra zero here. Um, but because this bug uh, is part of the consensus rules and it was uh, applicable in very early versions of the blockchain, we're kind of stuck with it unless we want to do a hard fork to get rid of it. Uh, and so Bitcoin still keeps this bug and some other related types of bugs going in the Bitcoin blockchain even today. So if you see a multi-sig unlocking script, you can expect to see something like this zero at the beginning whose only purpose is a workaround to a bug that is part of our consensus rules for the blockchain. Now, a couple other comments about uh, multi-signature scripts. Um, although they are a powerful feature, they're a little difficult to use. Um, not every wallet supports them. Also, uh, the transaction sizes tend to be larger than regular payment transactions which requires additional transaction fees, more computation space. So all those issues tend to make complicated locking scripts difficult in practice. And we will see these issues with other complicated locking scripts, which we're gonna talk about now. So let's talk about pay to script hash. Pay to script hash, it was introduced as a type of transaction to simplify the use of complicated transaction scripts. Um, so let's think about an example uh, before we dive into the details of how this is gonna work. So let's say, for example, we wanna use these multi-signature scripts we just talked about for a lot of customer payments. Um, and so payments that are made by customers are gonna lock so that they take at least two signatures to release. Um, say, for example, you're doing a transaction with a group of partners, we need to have at least two partners to sign it to release the funds. Um, and this, that way you can have some corporate governance controls and protects against theft, embezzlement or loss by a single member of the partnership. Um, well, if you're going to do a two of three uh, multi-sig, you might have, um, you know, the minimum number of two followed by, for example, three or four, well, let's say you have five partners in this case. So you'd have two followed by five public keys followed by a five, and then you'd have a check multi-sig. And so if any two of these five people are willing to spend the funds, the funds get spent. Well, that's a really long script compared to your usual Bitcoin uh, because you've got five public keys in there. Um, you know, and if you think about it, uh, let's suppose that we want all of our customers to be paying in Bitcoin to this partnership. Um, so every customer would have to use uh, the special Bitcoin wallet software with the ability to create uh, custom transaction scripts. 
each customer would have to understand how to create a transaction using custom scripts in their wallet uh, and the resulting transaction because it's got five public keys will be five times larger than a simple payment transaction because public keys are, are some of the largest data that are present in transactions so the burden of this and the burden of who pays for the transaction fees is typically borne by the customer because they're the one who is pushing the bitcoin transaction to the network um, and finally, you know, those large transaction scripts are going to be carried in the UTX, UTXO set and RAM and every node. So it's actually a burden on the blockchain as well. So all of those issues make using complex locking scripts difficult in practice. So pay to script hash was developed to resolve these practical difficulties and make the use of complex scripts as easy as payment to a standard Bitcoin address. Uh, with P2SH payments, uh, the complex locking script is essentially replaced with digital fingerprint, a, a hash. When a transaction attempting to spend the UTXO is presented later, it should contain the script that matches a hash in addition to the unlocking script. So in simple terms, P2SH says, pay to a script matching this hash, a script that will be presented later when this output is spent. Um, so in P2SH transactions, the locking script is replaced by the hash that's referred to as a redeem script, because it's presented to the system at redemption time rather than as a locking script. So basically in that case, you would only have to post um, the five public keys, the two of five transaction with the five public keys when you're actually spending the money. Um, and at that time, when you're redeeming these funds, um, since you're the one who's, you know, you're the merchant who accepted this payment, you would pay the transaction fees. You're not charging your customer any additional transaction fees. Furthermore, if a customer, you know, potentially it sent in lots of payments, um, you, when you're actually spending money as the merchant, you could do it in a single payment, um, so that you're not putting an increased burden on the, the Bitcoin network. So here's a look at what this example complicated script without paid to a uh, script hash might look like. And again, let's go with this two of five multi-six scheme as our example of locking script. So without using P2SH, it's just basically a two of five uh, multi-script. You know, we've got two, uh, we've got our five public keys followed by the five, followed by the check multi-sig. And our unlocking script begins with zero and a couple of signatures. Now, if we use P2SH, then our locking script is very short. It's hash 160. It's a hash of the redeem script, which is only 20 bytes, which is pretty small, followed by equal. Um, and this 20 byte hash looks like a, a Bitcoin address. Our unlocking script is the same unlocking script we had before, 0, sig 1, 0, sig 2, but it's now followed by what was our locking script before. Two, public key one, public key two, all the way through public key five, followed by five, check multi-sig. So with P2SH, the complex script that deals the conditions for spending the output, our redeem script, is not present in the locking script. We moved it to the unlocking script. So all we have in the locking script is a hash of that redeem script. And the redeem script then is just appended to the unlocking script. So this shifts the burden and fees and complexities away from the sender who creates a transaction to the recipient who is unlocking and spending the transaction. So I mentioned earlier the standard multi-signature scripts are limited to most three listed public keys and P2SSH scripts are limited to at most 15 listed public keys. But again, that may change over time. Um, and you can check the latest in the is standard function. Um, now with P2SH scripts, 
Um, it gets complicated to tell whether or not um, whether or not you're actually uh, complying with the standard. So before you write your P2SH script, you should double check um, what the is standard limit is currently for how many public keys you can list. Uh, because the Bitcoin uh, network won't actually check uh, your script when you lock it, it will only check your script when you unlock it. Because of course, uh, they have no, the network has no way to check a, a hash to see what the actual redeem script is. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, pay to script hash addresses. So another aspect of the pay to script hash feature is the ability to encode a script hash as an address um, as defined in the Bitcoin improvement proposal 13. Uh, pay to script hash addresses are base 58 check encodings of the 20 byte hash of a script, just like Bitcoin addresses are base 58 check encodings of the 20 byte hash of a public key. Uh, P2SH addresses use the version prefix five, which results in a base 58 check encoded address that starts with a three. Um, a hash can, you know, look very similar to a Bitcoin address. Um, but here, for example, you can see this P2SH address starts with three as opposed to a Bitcoin address typically starts with one. Um, and again, these addresses hide all the complexity uh, so that the person making a payment doesn't even realize that there's a script. Um, and as far as they know, it's just an address. There are a number of benefits to pay to script hash that we've talked about uh, compared to the direct use of complicated scripts and locking outputs. Again, these complicated scripts are replaced by shorter fingerprints in the transaction output, making the transaction smaller. Scripts can be coded as an address, so sender in the sender's wallet doesn't need complicated engineering to implement pay to sh uh, The sender can use almost any wallet to send a payment to this address. pay to sh uh, shifts the burden of constructing the script to the recipient, not the sender. It also shifts the burden in data storage for the long script from the output, which additionally being stored on the blockchain is in the UTXO set um, to, to only having to store the input. Um, and this shifting the burden is actually important because uh, what if someone got a typo when they were constructing the script to the recipient? Um, then, of course, uh, that payment would go missing. This way, all I have to do is make sure there's no typo in the address. Um, and then the sender is responsible for, you know, ensuring that there's no typo in the script. Uh, pay to SH also shifts the burden in data storage for the long script from the present time payment to a future time when it's spent. And pay to SH shifts the higher transaction fee cost of a long script from the sender to the recipient, who then has to include the long redeem script to actually spend those funds. So let's talk about redeem scripts and validation. Um, pay to SH was originally limited to standard types of Bitcoin transaction scripts. Uh, by the standard function, that meant that the redeem script presented in the spending transactions could only be one of the standard types, uh, pay to public key, pay to public key hash or multi-sig. Um, nowadays though, P2SH transactions can contain any valid script, making the P2SH standard much more flexible and allowing for experimentation with novel and complicated types of transactions. You are not able to put a P2SH inside a P2SH redeem script because the specification is not recursive. Also, while it's technically possible to include a return for data recording output in a redeem script, uh, as nothing in the rules prevents you from doing so, it's of no practical use because executing return during validation would cause a transaction to fail uh, because it would be marked invalid. Uh, because the redeem script is not presented to the network until you attempt to spend a P2SH output, if you lock an output with the hash of an invalid redeem script, that out, the output will be processed regardless, but then you won't be able to redeem it later. Uh, the UTXO will be successfully locked, but you won't be able to spend it because the spending transaction won't be accepted because it's an invalid script. So that creates a risk because you can lock Bitcoin in a P2SH that you won't be able to unlock and spend later. Um, the network will accept the P2SH locking script even if it corresponds to an invalid redeem script because the script hash doesn't give any indication of what script it represents. Um, 
So let's talk about data recording outputs uh, and using returns. Uh, Bitcoin's distributed and timestamp ledger, the blockchain has potential uses far beyond payments. Many developers have tried to use the Bitcoin scripting language to take advantage of the security and resilience of the system for applications such as digital notary services, stock certificates, smart contracts, and so on. Early attempts to use Bitcoin script language for these purposes involve creating transaction outputs that recorded data on the blockchain. Uh, for example, to record a digital fingerprint of a file in such a way that anyone could establish proof of existence of that file on a specific date by reference to a transaction. The use of Bitcoin's blockchain to store data unrelated Bitcoin payments is a controversial subject. Many developers consider such use abusive and want to discourage it. Others view it as a demonstration of the powerful capabilities of blockchain technology and want to encourage such experimentation. Those who object to the inclusion of non-payment data argue that it causes blockchain bloat, burdening uh, those running full Bitcoin nodes with carrying the cost of disk storage for data that the blockchain was not intended to carry. Moreover, such transactions create UTXOs that can't be spent using the destination Bitcoin address as a freeform 20 byte field. Because the address is used for data, it doesn't correspond to a private key and the resulting UTXO can never be spent if it's a fake payment. Uh, these transactions that can never be spent are therefore never removed from the UTXO set and cause the size of the UTXO database to forever increase or become bloated. A compromise was reached with the introduction of the return operator. Return allows developers to add 80 bytes of non-payment data to a transaction output. However, unlike with the use of a fake UTXO, the return operator creates an explicitly provably unspendable output, which does not need to be stored in the UTXO set. Return outputs are recorded on the blockchain, so they consume disk space and contribute to the increase in the blockchain size, but they are not stored in the UTXO set and therefore do not bloat the UTXO memory pool and burden full nodes with the cost of more expensive RAM. Uh, return scripts look like this, uh, return followed by the data. The data portion is limited by 80 to 80 bytes. It most often represents a hash, such as the output from a SHA-256 algorithm which is 32 bytes in size. Many applications put a prefix in front of the data to help identify the application. For example, the proof of existence digital notarization service uses an eight byte prefix doc proof, which is ASCII encoded as 44, 4F, and you can see the rest of the numbers here on the screen in hexadecimal format. Um, keep in mind, there is no unlocking script that corresponds to return that could possibly use to spend a return output. The whole point of return is that you can't spend the money locked in the output, and therefore it doesn't need to be held in the UTXO set as potentially spendable uh, because return is provably unspendable. Return is usually an output with a zero Bitcoin amount because any Bitcoin assigned to such an output is eff effectively lost forever. If a return is referenced as an input in a transaction, the script validation engine will halt the execution of the validation script and mark the transaction as invalid. The execution return essentially causes a script to return with a false and halt. Thus, if you accidentally reference a return output as an input in a transaction, that transaction will be invalid. So a standard transaction that is one that conforms to the as standard checks can only have one return output. However, a single return output can be combined in a transaction with outputs of any other type. Um, so there are a variety of various command line options that I'm not going to go through. Um, let's talk about time locks. Time locks are restrictions on transactions or outputs that only allow spending after a particular point in time. Bitcoin has had a transaction level time lock feature um, for a long time. It's implemented by the end lock time field in a transaction. 
some of the other time lock features that offer UTXO level time locks are check lock time verify and check sequence verify. Time locks are useful for post dating transactions and locking funds to a date in the future. Um, and time locks extend Bitcoin scripting into the dimension of time, opening the door for complex multi-step uh, smart contracts. So transact, let's talk about transaction lock time or end lock time. So Bitcoin has had this transaction level time lock feature and lock time from the beginning. Transaction lock time is a transaction level setting. It's a field in the transaction data structure that defines the earliest time that a transaction is valid and can be relayed on the network or added to the blockchain. Uh, lock time is also referred to as end lock time from the variable name that's used in the Bitcoin core code base. It is set to zero in most transactions to indicate immediate propagation and execution. That is, you can immediately uh, transact using this transaction. But if it's non-zero and below 500 million, it will be interpreted as a block height, meaning the transaction is not valid, is not relayed, or included in the blockchain prior to the specified block height. If it is greater than or equal to 500 million, it's inter interpreted as a Unix epoch timestamp, which is the second since January 1, 1970. And the transaction is not valid prior to that specified time. Transactions with end lock time specifying a future block or time must be held by the originating system and transmitted to the Bitcoin network only after they become valid. If a transaction is transmitted to the network before the specified end lock time, the transaction will be rejected by the first node as invalid and will not be relayed to other nodes. Um, the use of end lock time is very similar to post dating a public paper check. There are some limitations with this. Um, end lock time has a limitation that why it makes it possible to spend some outputs in the future, it doesn't make it impossible to spend them until that time. Let me explain. Let's suppose Alice signs a transaction spending one of her outputs to Bob's address and sets a transaction lock time to three months in the future. Alice sends that transaction to Bob to hold uh, with this transaction, Alice and Bob know the following. Bob cannot transmit the transaction to redeem the funds in the Bitcoin network until those three months have elapsed. But he can transmit that transaction after three months. However, Alice could decide to spend those funds before the three months expires essentially doing the equivalent of a double spend. Um, she's told Bob she, he can have these funds three months from now, but she decides she's going to spend them in month one. And then when Bob goes to spend the funds in month three, they're already gone. Um, and Bob has no guarantee that Alice won't do that before his uh, end lock time transaction becomes valid. So it's important to understand this limitation of transaction and lock time. The only guarantee is that Bob won't be able to redeem it for three months if it elapsed. Um, there is no guarantee that Bob will get those funds because Alice could spend them somewhere else before that time. So if we wanted to achieve such a guarantee, we'd have to put this restriction on the UTXO itself, make it part of the locking script rather than on the transaction. And that's achieved in another capability referred to as check lock time verify or CLTV. Um, so check lock time verify was based on the specification for Bitcoin improvement proposal 65. Um, so this added this uh, check lock time verify operator to the Bitcoin language. So instead of a transaction level time lock, CLTV is an output based time lock. So you add this CLTV operation code in the redeem script of an output, and it will restrict that output so it can only be spent after the specified time has elapsed. So CLTV doesn't really replace end lock time, but it 
uh, restrict specific UTXOs that can only be spent in future transactions with a lock time set to a particular value. And it takes one parameter as an input expressed as a number in the same format as n lock time, either as a block height or a Unix epoch time. As indicated by the verify suffix, CLTV is the type of op code that halts execution of the script if the outcome is false. If it results in true, execution continues. So in order to lock an output with CLTV, you put in the redeem script of the output and the transaction that creates the output. Uh, so for example, if Alice is paying Bob's address, the output would normally contain a P2 uh, public key hash script like this. All right, so we've got uh, dupe hash 160 public key B equal verify check SIG. That is our normal public key pay public key hash uh, script. So now let's say we want to modify this so that um, that Bitcoin can only be spent until three months later. So instead, what we would do is we would do the following. We would uh, put our CLTV value, which is going to be you know now plus three months later. Uh, then we, whether you decide to do that in block height or in time, then you would do check lock time verify, followed by drop. And then the rest of this is identical to the normal script. You know, do patch 160 public key equal verify check sig. Um, and so what your current block height would be is, you know, whatever, you know, the current block height plus some number of blocks, uh, three months is about 12,000 blocks. Um, so the current block height, you know, plus 12,000 or current time plus like 7 million seconds to get three months. And that's what would go there. So when Bob tries to spend this UTXO, uh, he'll construct a transaction that references the UTXO as an input. He uses a signature and public key in the unlocking script of the input and sets the transaction at lock time to equal or greater than the time lock in the check lock time verify. He then broadcasts that transaction on the Bitcoin network. Bob's transaction is evaluated as followed. If the check lock time verify parameter Alice set is less than or equal to the spending transaction's lock time, then the script execution continues. Otherwise, the script execution halts and the transaction is deemed invalid. Um, so by using end lock time in conjunction with CLTV, the scenario that we talked about where, uh, where Alice might lock funds, send it to Bob, and then Alice could do a double spend can't happen. At this point, by putting the time lock in, with the transaction, those funds are locked until the time passes. So relative time locks are a way to uh, have some greater flexibility. Um, the previous approach that we showed with end lock time and CLTV included absolute time locks, Tom like absolute time locks, specifying either the specific block height or the specific time at which time it's it unlocks the Bitcoin. Uh, relative time lock features allow you to specify an elapsed time from the confirmation of the output in the blockchain. Relative time locks are useful because they allow a chain of two or more interdependent transactions to be held off chain while imposing a time constraint on one transaction that's dependent on the elapsed time from the confirmation of a previous transaction. In other words, the clock doesn't start counting until the UTXO is recorded in the blockchain. This is particularly useful in bi-directional state channels and lightning networks. Uh, relative time locks like absolute time locks are implemented with both a transaction level feature and a script level opcode. Transaction level relative time lock is implemented as a consensus rule on the value of end sequence, which is a transaction field that's set in every transaction input. Script level relative time locks are implemented with the check sequence verify CSV opcode. And these relative time locks 
uh, are implemented according to specifications in several Bitcoin improvement proposals, including BIP68, uh, relative lock time using consensus and four sequence numbers, and BIP112 using check sequence verify. So the original meaning of end sequence was originally intended to allow modification of transactions in the mempool. And that use of transaction containing inputs uh, with an end sequence value below a certain number indicated transaction was not yet finalized. Such transaction will be held in the mempool and it was replaced by another transaction spending the inputs with a higher end sequence value. Once the transaction was received, his inputs had a, a value of a uh, partic uh, particular form number, it would be considered finalized in mind. That original meaning of end sequence was never properly implemented and it was never really used. Um, so nowadays we're going to use uh, end sequence as a consensus enforced time lock. So transaction inputs with end sequence values less than two to the 31 are interpreted as having a relative time lock. Transaction, um, so such a transaction is only valid once the input has been aged by the relevant relative time lock amount. For example, a transaction with one input with an end sequence relevant time lock of 30 blocks is only valid when at least 30 blocks have elapsed from the time the UTXO referenced the input was mined. Since end sequence is a per input field, a transaction could contain any number of time locked inputs, all of which must be sufficiently aged for the transaction to be valid. A transaction can include both time locked inputs and inputs without a time lock. The end sequence value is specified in either blocks or seconds, but in a slightly different format than we saw used in end lock time. A type flag is used to differentiate between values counting value blocks and values counting time in seconds. Um, if the type flag is set, then the end sequence value is interpreted as a multiple of 512 seconds. If it's not set, it's interpreted as a number of blocks. When interpreting end sequence as a relative time lock, only the 16 least significant bits are considered. So here's a look at how this works. Um, the 16 bits are over here in blue. Um, and then the other bits to the right are used for flags. Um, this flag over in 22 in green uh, determines whether it's blocks or, or seconds. And this flag in orange over here is used to determine whether it's relatively time locked or not relatively time locked. And then these others are not used yet, but could be used in other standards in the future for other types of flags. So let's talk about relative time locks with CSV. So just like CLTV and end lock time, there is a script opcode for relative time locks that leverages the end sequence value in scripts. That opcode is check sequence verify or CSV for short. The CSV opcode when evaluated in UTXO's redeem script allows spending only in a transaction whose input end sequence value is greater than or equal to the CSV parameter. Essentially this restricts spending the UTXO until a certain number of blocks or seconds have elapsed relative to the time the UTXO was mined. As with CLTV, the value in CSV must match the format in the corresponding end sequence value. If CSV is specified in terms of blocks, then so must end sequence be specified. If CSV is specified in terms of seconds, then CSV must also be uh, in terms of seconds in end sequence. Uh, relative time locks of CSV are especially useful when several chain transactions are created and signed, but not propagated when they're kept off chain. A child transaction cannot be used until the parent transaction has been propagated, mined, and aged by the time specified in the relative time lock. As I mentioned previously, uh, one place where this is very useful is in state channels and lightning networks. And CSV is described in detail in Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 112 on check sequence verify. Um, so let's talk about median time. As part of the activation of relative time locks, 
There was also a change in the way time is calculated for time locks, both absolute and relative. In Bitcoin, there's a subtle but very significant difference between the time on your clock and the time of consensus. Bitcoin is a decentralized network, which means that each participant has his or her own perspective of time. Events on the network do not occur instantaneously everywhere. Network latency must be factored into the perspectives of each node. Eventually, everything is synchronized to create a common ledger. Um, you know, Bitcoin reaches consensus on average every 10 minutes about the state of the ledger as it existed previously in the past. So the timestamps set in block headers are set by the miners, um, in particular by the miner that won that particular uh, mining competition, uh, won that particular proof of work race and, and was awarded that particular block. And there's a certain degree of latitude allowed by the consensus rules to account for differences in clock accuracy between these decentralized nodes run by different miners. However, this can create an unfortunate incentive for miners to lie about the time in a block so as to earn extra fees by including time lock transactions that are not yet mature. So to remove the incentive to lie and to strengthen the security of time locks, a Bitcoin proposal was proposed and activated at the same time as the Bitcoin improvement proposals for relative time locks. This is Bitcoin improvement proposal 113, which includes a consensus measurement of time that's called median time passed. Median time passed is calculated by taking the timestamps of the last 11 blocks and finding the median. The median time then becomes consensus time and is used for all time lock calculations. By taking the midpoint from approximately two hours in the past, the influence of any one block's timestamp is reduced. By incorporating 11 blocks, no single miner can influence the timestamp or to gain fees from transactions with a time lock that hasn't yet matured. Median time pass changes the implementation of time calculations for end lock time and sequence, CLTV and CSV. The consensus time calculated by median time pass is always approximately one hour behind wall clock time. If you could create time lock transactions, you should for account for median time pass when estimating the desired value to encode in end lock time and sequence, CLTV and CSV. So let's talk about why they did that. So it's theoretically possible that a miner could attempt to uh, rewrite past blocks to snipe higher fee transactions from future blocks to maximize their profitability. Uh, for example, let's say the highest block in existence is block 100,000. If instead of attempting to mine block 100,001 to extend the chain, some miners attempt to remine block 100,000. These miners can choose to include any valid transaction that has been mined yet in their candidate block 100,000. They don't have to remine the block with the same transactions. In fact, they have the incentive to select the most profitable transactions to include in their block. You know, the, the block, the transactions with the highest fees per kilobyte. Uh, they could include any transactions that were in the old block 100,000, as well as any transactions from the current mempool. Essentially, they have the option to pull transactions from the present into the rewritten past when they recreate block 100,000. This attack isn't very lucrative uh, currently because block rewards are much higher than total fees per block. But at some point in the future, uh, transaction fees will be the majority of the mining reward or even the entirety of the mining reward once we get to 2140 and there aren't new Bitcoins being passed out. At that time, the scenario may be a viable attack. To prevent fee sniping, when Bitcoin Core creates transactions, it uses end lock time to limit them to the next block. Uh, so in our scenario, Bitcoin Core would set end lock time to 100,001 on any transactions it created. Under normal circumstances, this lock time has no effect. The transaction could only be included in block 100,001 anyway. It's the next block. But under a blockchain fork double spend attack, the miners would not be able to pull high fee transactions from the mempool because all those transactions will be time locked to block 100,001. They can only remine 100,000 with whatever transactions are valid at the time, essentially gaining no new fees. So 
So to achieve this, Bitcoin Core sets the lock time of all new transactions to current block plus one and sets the end sequence of all the inputs uh, to enable end lock time. All right, let's talk about scripts with flow control. One of the more powerful features of Bitcoin scripts uh, is flow control or conditional clauses. Uh, you're probably familiar with flow control in various programming languages. You use the construct if then, else, um, and so on. Uh, Bitcoin conditional clauses look a bit different, but are essentially the same construct. At a basic level, Bitcoin conditional codes allow us to construct a redeem script that has multiple ways of being unlocked, depending on a true false outcome of evaluating a logical condition. For example, if X is true, then the redeem script is A, and if the else redeem script is B. Additionally, Bitcoin conditional expressions can be nested, meaning that a conditional clause can contain another conditional clause within it, which contains another and so on indefinitely. So Bitcoin script flow control can be used to construct very complicated scripts while hundreds or even thousands of possible uh, execution paths. There is no limit to nesting, but consensus rules impose a limit on the maximum size in bytes of a script. Uh, Bitcoin implements flow control using if, else, and if, not if operation codes. Uh, additionally, conditional expressions can contain Boolean operators such as a Boolean, a Boo or, and a, and a not. Uh, at first glance, uh, the Bitcoin flow control scripts could be somewhat confusing, uh, but, and this is because Bitcoin script is a stack language. The same way that one plus one looks backward when you expressed as one one add, flow control clauses in Bitcoin also look somewhat backward. Um, here's an example on the left of a traditional uh, procedural flow of control. We have if something code to run, else code to run if it's false, and then you keep on going with code to run in either case. So in Bitcoin, you've got your condition, then you follow if and then you've got the code to run when condition is true, else code to run if the condition is false, and then end if uh, identifies that the if has ended, and then you continue on with the code to run in either case. So when reading Bitcoin script, remember that the condition to be evaluated comes before the if statement. So let's talk about the verify opcode. Another form of conditional in Bitcoin script is any outcode that ends in verify. The verify suffix means that the condition evaluated is not true, execution of the script terminates immediately, and the transaction is deemed invalid. Unlike an if clause, which offers alternative execution paths, the verify suffix acts as a guard clause continuing only if the precondition is met. Uh, for example, um, here's a script that requires Bob's signature and a pre-image secret that produces a specific hash. Uh, both conditions must be satisfied to unlock it. So we've got hash 160, expected hash equal verify Bob's public key and check sig. Um, so to redeem that, we need to have both Bob's signature and the hash pre-image. With Bob's signature going to Bob's public key and the hash pre-image going to that expected hash. Without presenting the pre-image, hash can't get to the part of the script that checks his signature. You could rewrite that as an if clause. You know, something like hash 160 expected hash equal if Bob's public key checks sig and if. Uh, you could also uh, use create a one and two multi sig script here uh, with you know if pub key A check sig else pub key B check sig instead of doing a one and two multi sig. Um, but in both cases, our unlocking script would be signature A or signature B.
So in this particular case, though, you'll notice when you look at this uh, multi-sig script that it doesn't actually have a condition clause uh, before the if. So what's really happening is when we pass in our signature block, um, it's the one or the zero that's determining which uh, whether we're going to if or else. So we have sig A1. The one is being um, used to determine true that then if and we do what's in the if. The zero indicates false. So that's going to send us the else and we do the pub key check sig. Uh, again, thinking about this from a stacking perspective and how the stack is putting items on the stack and then popping them off. Uh, and since if clauses can be nested, you could have uh, multiple layers of execution paths um, that are combined together. So for example, here we see uh, multiple if else statements nested together. So in this particular case, what we're attempting to show here is that we're gonna have three partners and a company lawyer. The three partners are going to make decisions based on majority rule, uh, two of three. However, if there's a problem with the keys, they want their lawyers to be able to recover their funds with one of the three partner signatures. But if all of the partners are unavailable or incapacitated for a while, they want the lawyer to be able to manage the account directly. So in this particular case, um, You know, we're going to have the script operate as a simple two or three multi sig uh, with the three partners. And so our unlocking script to add to, to do that might be um, the, you know, for example, two signatures from two of the three partners. Um, again, as a multi sig followed by a couple trues. So we go through these first two if clauses are true and we hit the fact that you need two then you would skip over the else and the end if, and then you'd have your three public keys and it becomes a two or three multi-sig. Um, however, um, let's suppose that um, there's been a breakdown and um, only one of the partners is available with the attorney. Uh, and we're gonna say, okay, but if that's the case, we're gonna wait 30 days. Um, so after 30 days uh, have elapsed uh, at, from the creation of the UTXO, the signature of uh, one of the lawyers and one of the partners is available on line seven. So how we would do that is we would have a zero followed by, again, the two signatures. We'd have a false to bypass this first if statement. And I'm sorry, a true to bypass the first if statement, a false to go to the first else statement. And then you'd have your 30 days check sequence verify drop uh, followed by your uh, multi-signature, three public keys, your three check sig, and then you would be able to go forward. But let's suppose we want it to uh, let the attorney spend the funds themselves after 90 days to select that execution path. Um, we'd have to uh, get past the first if else statement. So we would basically have a false there. So we bypass the first if statement and go over here to the second one. And now we've got 90 days, check sequence, verify, drop followed by um, the attorney's public key and check SIG. Um, so, so long as 90 days have been passed, that public key, we just need a digital signature that maps to that public key. Now, a couple of things to think about is, well, why can't the lawyer or, you know, who's down here with Z's public key, do that at any time? Uh, well, because it's locked for 90 days. Um, how many execution paths can you be, you know, uh, what if the lawyer loses his key? Well, even if the lawyer loses his key, two of the three partners can still spend the funds. Um, and what if uh, the partners are happy and they don't see any need to have the lawyer active at 90 days? Well, then you just spend the money out of this and you uh, recreate another transaction.
All right, let's talk about in. So here we can see these three examples uh, to unlock with the two partners. It's just going to be two out of three partners, two signatures, and true, true to get into this first sequence of two of three. Um, the second execution path, uh, only after 30 days, we've got two signatures, including the lawyer's signature, and then false true to get over into this area. And then for the third execution path, we just need the signature of the attorney and false, but it can only happen after 90 days. So let's talk about segregated witness. Segregated witness was an upgrade to the Bitcoin consensus rules and network protocol that was part of Bitcoin Improvement Proposal 9, and it was activated on Bitcoin's main net on August 1st, 2017. Um, in cryptography, the term witness is used to describe a solution to a cryptographic puzzle. In Bitcoin terms, the witness satisfies a cryptographic condition placed on an unspent transaction output, a UTXO. In the context of Bitcoin, a digital signature is one type of witness, but a witness can be more broadly any solution that can satisfy the conditions imposed on a UTXO and unlock that UTXO for spending. The term witness is a more general term for an unlocking script or script signature or script sig. Uh, before segregated witnesses uh, introduction, every input in a transaction was followed by the witness data that unlocked it. The witness data was embedded in the transaction as part of each input. So the term segregated witness or seg wit for short simply means separating uh, the witness or the signature or unlocking script of a specific input. Think separate script sig or separate signature in its simplest form. So segregated witness therefore um, is an architectural change in Bitcoin that aims to move the witness data from the script sig or unlocking script field of a transaction into a separate witness data structure that will accompany the transaction. Clients can request the transaction data with or without the accompanying witness data. So we're going to take a look at some of the benefits of segregated witness, uh, including the mechanism used to deploy and implement the architectural change and demonstrate the use of segregated witness in transactions and addresses. And segregated witness has been defined by a number of different Bitcoin improvement proposals. Uh, BIP 141 had the main definition of segregated witness. BIP 143 had transaction signature verification. Uh, for the version zero witness program. BIP 144 had peer services, uh, new network messages and serialization formats. BIP 145 had to get block template updates for segregated witness for mining. And BIP 173 had a base 32 address format uh, for native version zero to 16 witness outputs. So why segregated witness? Since the witness data is only a part of the transaction that can be modified by a third party, removing it also removes the opportunity for transaction malleability attacks. Um, well, with Sergey Witness, transaction hashes become immutable by anyone other than the creator of the transaction, which greatly improves the implementation of many other protocols that rely on advanced Bitcoin transaction construction such as payment channels, chain transactions, and lightning networks. Script versioning. Uh, with the introduction of segregated witness scripts, every locking script is preceded by a script version number, similar to how transactions and blocks have version numbers. Uh, the addition of a script version number allows the scripting language to be upgraded in a backward compatible way i.e. using soft fork upgrades to introduce new script operands, syntax, semantics, and so on. The ability to upgrade the scripting language in a non-descriptive way should accelerate the rate of innovation in Bitcoin. Network and storage scaling. The witness data is often a big contributor to the total size of a transaction. More complicated scripts, such as those used for multi-sig or payment channels, can be very large. In some cases, these scripts account for the majority of the data in the transaction. By moving the witness data outside the transaction data, segregated witness should improve Bitcoin scalability. Nodes can prove the witness, prune the witness data after validating the signatures or ignore, ignore it altogether when doing simplified payment verification, SPV. 
the witness data does not need to be transmitted to all nodes and does not need to be stored on disk by all nodes. Signature verification optimization. Segregated witness upgrades the signature functions like check sig and check multi-sig to reduce the algorithm's computational complexity. Before SegWit, the algorithm used to produce a signature required a number of hash operations that was proportional to the size of the transaction. Data hashing computations increased in ON squared with respect to the number of signature operations, introducing a substantial computational burden on all nodes verifying the signature. With SegWit, the algorithm has changed, reduced complexity to O of N, which is significantly uh, more efficient. Uh, offline signing improvement, segregated witness signatures incorporate the value amount referenced by each input in the hash that is signed. Previously, an offline signing device, such as a hardware wallet, would have to verify the amount of each input before signing a transaction. This was usually accomplished by streaming a large amount of data about the previous transactions references inputs. Since the amount is now part of the commitment hash that is signed, an offline device does not need the previous transactions. If the amounts do not match, are misrepresented by a compromised online system, the signature will be invalid. So how does segregated witness work? At first glance, segregated witness appears to be a change to how transactions are constructed and therefore a transaction level feature. Uh, but it's not. Rather, segregated witness has changed to how individual UTXOs are spent and therefore is a per output feature. Uh, a transaction can span segregated witness outputs or traditional inline witness outputs or both. Therefore, it does not make much, make much sense to refer to a transaction as a segregated witness transaction. Uh, instead, we should refer to specific trans, transaction outputs as segregated witness outputs. When a transaction spends a UTXO, it must provide a witness. And a trans in a traditional UTXO, the locking script requires witness data to be provided in line in the input part of the transaction that spends the UTXO. A segregated witness UTXO, however, specifies a locking script that can be satisfied with witness data outside of the input, um, which is segregated. So segregated witness was a significant change to the way outputs and transactions are architected. Such a change would normally require a simultaneous change in every Bitcoin node and wallet to change the consensus rules, what is known as a hard fork. Um, Instead, however, segregated witness was introduced with a much less disruptive change, which is backwards compatible, known as a soft fork. This type of upgrade allows non-upgraded software to ignore the changes and continue to operate without any disruption. Uh, so long as the upgraded nodes have more than 50% of the nodes, the upgrade will work smoothly. If the upgraded nodes are less than 50%, then there could be issues with, on a soft fork. Um, so segregated witness outputs are constructed so that older systems that are not SegWit aware can still validate them. Newer versions will see the output and validate the segregated witness. So let's look at some example transactions and how they would change with segregated witness. We'll first take a look at a pay to public key hash scenario um, and then look at uh, pay to script hash. So imagine that Alice is creating a transaction to pay Bob for a cup of coffee. Um, so here's a we'll look at what our pay to public key hash script would look like. Uh, you know, we've got uh, dupe hash 160 public key hash equal verify check sig. And an equivalent um, of an output script and P2 witness public key hash is just zero public key hash. To an old node, these two outputs would look like an output anyone can spend without requiring a signature. To a SegWit aware client, the first part is zero is a version number, the witness version, and the second part is a public key hash equivalent to a locking script known as a witness program.
As you can see, a segregated witness output uh, locking script is much simpler than a traditional locking script. It's shorter. Uh, it still has the same public key hash, but we didn't bother to put in the dupe, the hash 160, or the equal verifier, the check sig. All that's kind of subsumed under zero. Um, Now let's look at how we spend that public key uh, hash output. So we got two hash 160, a hash, an equal verified check sig. That's uh, normally what we got. Um, if we want to spend this with witness, we just have our zero public key hash. Uh, um, so actually, um, and it's extremely important to know that pay to witness public key hash should only be created by the payee and not converted by the sender from a known public key, uh, P2PKH script or address. Uh, pay to witness public key hash output should be created by the payee's wallet by deriving a compressed public key from their private key. Uncompressed public keys are non-standard in SegWit and may be display, uh, disabled in a future fork. If the hash used in the pay to witness public key hash came from an uncompressed public key, it could be unspendable and you could lose funds. All right, so let's take a look at a pay to witness uh, script hash. The second type of witness program uh, corresponds to a pay to script hash uh, that we saw earlier. So for example, here's an example of pay to script hash uh, script we saw, hash 160, the script hash and equal. Uh, and in particular, for example, we had an example of a two of five multi-sig that this script hash would equate to on the redeem script. And you can see here, the redeem script down here is a sig A, sig B, and two of five with the multi check multi-sig. So our example for a pay to witness script hash is again, is a zero followed by the script hash. So instead of having hash 160 and equal, both of those are essentially replaced by this just zero. Uh, but again, if you decode it, you'll see, um, you know, your, your witness is over here. So when we're thinking about the differences between uh, pay to witness public key hash and pay to witness script hash. Uh, both types of witness programs consist of a single byte version number followed by a hash. They look very similar, but they're interpreted very differently. One's interpreted as a public key hash which is satisfied by digital signature and the other is a script hash, which is satisfied by a redeem script. Uh, one of the difference between these two is the length of the hash. Public key hash in P2 witness public key hash is 20 bytes. The script hash in P2 WSH is 32 bytes. By looking at the length difference between those two hashes, a wallet can determine whether it's a public key or a script. So as we can see from the previous examples, you know, upgrading the soft fork uh, to Sergey Witness is a two-step process. First, wallets must create special SegWit type outputs. Then those outputs can be spent by wallets to know how to construct a segregated witness transaction. Um, both the sender and the recipient wallets need to be able to support SegWit. Now, this uh, change came in in 2017. So most modern Bitcoin wallets will support SegWit, but if you're using a wallet that you have not updated since 2016, uh, it may very well not support it. And so just make sure that you've upgraded your wallet software in the last few years and you should be fine. Um, let's see. You can embed segregated witness inside a public to pay to uh, SH. Um, if uh, your wallet does not support segregated witness, but as I mentioned, most uh, wallets will support it today. So it shouldn't be a problem. 
When sender and receiver wallets are supporting SegWit, it makes sense to encode witness scripts directly uh, rather than embed it into P2SH. Uh, the native SegWit address formats defined in Bitcoin and Proof of Proposal 173. BIP-173 only encodes the witness scripts, pay to, pay to witness public key hash and pay to witness script hash. It's not compatible with non-Segwick uh, scripts. Um, and BIP-173 is a checksum base 32 encoding, which is different from the base 58 encoding of traditional Bitcoin addresses. Um, so here we can see the uh, 32 lowercase uh, only alphanumeric character set that BIP 173 uses. It doesn't have the number of one, lowercase b, lowercase i, or lowercase zero uh, to avoid um, typos and so forth. And here's some examples of addresses that comply with the standard. For example, this BC1QW on TB and BC and TB uh, for P2SH and P2WPKH it addresses. Um, and a SegWick string of this type can be up to 90 characters long and will typically have three parts, a human readable part, a separator, and then a data part, which is a checksum uh, encoding the witness script. And here's a look at the different prefixes that are used by SegWit and non-SegWit addresses so that you can easily identify what is this address. You know, if the address begins with one, it's a P2PKH address. If it begins with an M or N, it's a testnate P2PKH address. If it begins with a three, it's a P2SH address. And if it's a two, it's a testnet P2SH address and so on. Um, and then we get the various types of SegWit addresses, beginning with a three, a BC1, or a TB1, depending on uh, which network you're on and what format it is. One of the benefits of Sergey Witness is that it eliminates third-party transaction malleability. Before Sergey Witness, transactions could have their signatures subly mod modified by third parties. Changing their transaction hash without changing any fundamental properties of the inputs, outputs, and amounts. This created opportunities for denial of service attacks, as well as attacks against poorly written wallets software that assumed unconfirmed transactions were immutable. With the introduction of segregated witness, transactions have two identifiers a TXID and a WTXID. Um, the traditional transaction TXID is a double SHA-256 hash of the serialized transaction without the witness data. The WTXID is a double SHA-256 hash of the new serialized format of the transaction with witness data. The traditional TXID is calculated exactly the same way. Um, however, since a pure SegWit transaction has empty script SIGs in every input, there's a, no part of the transaction can modify by a third party. Therefore, in a pure SegWit transaction, the TXID is immutable by a third party, even if the transaction is unconfirmed. The WTXID is like an extended ID and that the hash also incorporates the witness data. If a transaction is transmitted without the witness data, then the WTXID and TXID are identical. Since WTXID includes witness data, i.e. digital signatures, and since witness data can be malleable, the WTXID should be considered malleable until the transaction is confirmed. Only the TXID of a pure SegWit transaction can be considered mutable, immutable by third parties. Segregated witness has a new signing algorithm, uh, which modifies the semantics of the four signature verif verification functions, check sig, check sig verify, check multi-sig, and check multi-sig verify changing the way a transaction commitment hash is calculated. Uh, signatures in Bitcoin transactions are applied on a commitment hash, which is calculated from the transaction data, locking specific parts of the data and indicating the signer's commitment to those values. For example, in a single SIG hash all type signature, the commitment hash includes all inputs and outputs. Unfortunately, the way the commitment hash was calculated introduced the possibility that a node verifying the signature 
can be forced to perform a significant number of hash computations. Specifically, the hash operations increase in O and squared with respect to the number of signature operations in the transaction. An attacker could therefore create a transaction with a very large number of signature operations, causing the entire Bitcoin network to have to perform hundreds or thousands of hash operations to verify the transaction. SegWit represents an opportunity to address this problem by changing the way the commitment hash is calculated. For SegWit version zero witness programs, signature verification occurs using an approved commitment hash algorithm as specified in BIP 143. The new algorithm achieves two important goals. Firstly, the number of hash operations increases by a much more gradual ON to the number of signature operations, reducing the opportunity to create denial of service attacks with a complicated transaction. Secondly, the commitment now also includes the value amounts of each input as part of the commitment. This means that a signer can commit to a specific input value without needing to fetch and check the previous transaction referenced by the input. In the case of offline devices, such as hardware wallets, this simplifies communication between the host and the hardware wallet, removing the need to stream previous transactions for validation. Hardware wallet can accept the input value as stated by an untrusted host. Since the signature is invalid, if that input value is not correct, the hardware wallet doesn't need to validate the value before signing the input. Let's talk about some economic incentives for segregated witness. Bitcoin mining nodes and full nodes incur costs for the resources used to support the Bitcoin network and the blockchain. As the volume of transactions increases, so does the cost of resources, CPU, network, memory, disk space, and so on. Miners are compensated for these costs through fees that are proportional to the size of each transaction. Non-mining full nodes aren't compensated, so they incur these costs because they would need to run an authoritative, fully validated index node, uh, perhaps because they use the node to operate a Bitcoin business. Without transaction fees, the growth in Bitcoin data would arguably increase dramatically. Fees are intended to align the needs of Bitcoin users with the burden their transactions impose on the network through a market-based price discovery mechanism. The calculation of fees based on transaction size treats all the data in the transaction as equal in cost. But from the perspective of full nodes and miners, some parts of transactions carry much higher costs. Every transaction added to the Bitcoin network affects the consumption of four node resources on the nodes. From a disk space perspective, every transaction is stored in the blockchain, adding the total size of the blockchain. The blockchain is stored on disk, but the storage can be optimized by deleting older transactions. From a CPU perspective, every transaction has to be validated, which requires CPU time. Uh, from a bandwidth perspective, every transaction is transmitted across the network at least once. Without any optimization in the block propagation protocol, transactions would be transmitted again as part of a block, doubling the impact on network capacity. And from a memory perspective, nodes that validate transactions keep the UTXO index or the entire UTXO set in memory to speed up validation. Because memory is at least one order of magnitude more expensive than disk, growth of the UTXO set contributes disproportionately to the cost of running a node. Now, not every part of a transaction has an equal impact on the cost of running a node or on the ability of Bitcoin to scale to support more transactions. The most expensive part of a transaction is the newly created outputs as they are added to the in-memory UTXO set. By comparison, signatures like the witness data add the least burden to the network and the cost of running a node because witness data is only validated once and then never used again. Furthermore, immediately after receiving a new transaction and validating the witness data, nodes can discard that witness data. If fees are calculated on transaction size without discriminating between these two types of data, then the market incentives of fees are not aligned with the actual cost imposed by a transaction. In fact, the current fee structure actually encourages the opposite behavior because witness data is the largest part of a transaction. The incentives created by fees matter because they affect the behavior of wallets. All wallets need to implement a strategy for assembling transactions that takes into consideration a number of factors, such as privacy, uh, reducing address reuse, fragmentation, making lots of 
loose change, and fees. If the fees are overwhelmingly motivating wallets to use as few inputs as possible in transactions, this can lead to UTXO picking and change address strategies that inadvertently bloat the UTXO set. Transactions consume UTXOs in their inputs and create new UTXOs with their outputs. A transaction therefore has more inputs and outputs will result in a decrease in the UTXO set. Whereas a transaction that has more outputs than inputs will result in an increase in the UTXO set. Let's consider the difference between inputs and outputs and call that the net new UTXO. That's an important metric as it tells us what impact a transaction will have on the most expensive network rewired re resource, the in-memory UTXO set. A transaction with positive net new UTXOs adds to that burden. Transaction with a negative net new UTXO reduces the burden. We would therefore want to encourage transactions that are either negative net new UTXOs or neutral with net new UTXOs. Let's look at an example of what incentives are created by the transaction fee calculations with and without segregated witness. Uh, transaction A is a three input, two output transaction which is a net new UTXO metric of negative one, meaning it consumes one more UTXO than it creates, reducing the UTXO set by one because it's three inputs and two outputs. Transaction B is a two input, three output transaction, which has a net new UTXO metric of one, meaning it adds one UTXO to the UTXO set, imposing additional costs on the entire Bitcoin network. Both transactions using, mul using multi-signature 203 scripts to demonstrate how complex uh, scripts increase the impact of segregated witness of fees. So let's assume a transaction fee rate of, of 30 Satoshi per byte and a 75% fee discount on witness behavior. So without segregated witness, uh, transaction A is 28,000 Satoshi and transaction B is 20,000 20, Satoshi. With segregated witness, transaction A is 12,000 Satoshi and transaction B is 10,000. Both transactions are less expensive when segregated witness is implemented. Comparing the cost between the two transactions, see that before segregated witness, the transactions positive net new had significant cost savings. Um, with segregated witness, the cost difference treats significantly in absolute as well as relative terms. While it would require inputs to become cheaper than outputs to incentivize UTXO set or consideration, the discount reduces the incentive of creating new UTXOs in order to avoid using more new inputs. Segregated witness therefore has two main effects on the fees paid by Bitcoin users. First, it reduces the overall cost of transactions by discounting witness data and increasing capacity of the blockchain. Secondly, SegWit's discount on witness data can partially mit mitigate a misalignment of incentives between uh, the miners that may have inadvertently created more bloat in the UTXO set. So I wanna thank everyone for watching this lecture. Uh, this uh, lecture is licensed under Creative Commons. Uh, it's based on materials uh, from the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos. I wanna thank Andreas for making his content available under this license. And this video is also covered by the uh, Creative Commons license. Uh, so again, thanks for watching this lecture on advanced transactions and Bitcoin script, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett.